podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Welcome to Smart People Podcast. This is Chris. And this is John. We hope you all had a great holiday. Fantastic. Whatever you might be celebrating. Hopefully you got to do it with some family or friends or just enjoyed the time off of work. Thanks for tuning in to the Smart People Podcast again. It will be the last of 2012. <sighs> right? Another year Applause. down the drain. Down the drain. I don't know. I oh, just, man. And actually, it's kind of a fitting episode because we are going to be talking about war. And the, cool. the reason I think it's fitting is because the flip side of war is peace. What is it good for? And, you know, the whole new year, maybe you can think about peace and peacefulness. I don't know. We need a little more of that in our world. But I agree. you can only do that if you become educated on the opposite of it, which would be war. So that's what we're discussing this episode. It is awesome. Our guest is the leader in basically thinking about all aspects of war and more of the, the repercussions, what goes into it, just war theory, if you're not familiar with it, which is something John and I didn't know much about. Now I feel like I do. Anytime that you get to talk to somebody that has their book as a required textbook yeah. for college classes, you know you're going to at least learn something. And it was funny, too, because he was so spot on. I was oh, like, how yeah. does he know? You know, how does he know all this? And he said, well, I'm in the process of writing it over again, you know, updating it. So so um, we'll get into that in our, in our guest in a minute. Uh, just wanted to make sure you guys are, you know, checking us out. And smartpeoplepodcast.com is the website. We write a post uh, along with our guest and kind of give you a little more information and also check us out, Facebook, Twitter. Contact us. We love hearing from you guys. It's the reason we do it. Believe me, it is a time drain, if anything. Yeah, <laughs> and we've got a new year coming up. So if you want to shoot us emails and give us suggestions for guests to have on the show, yeah. you saw what happened last time. We got a bunch of emails and we, we, we reached out them. to every single person. We didn't get every single well, one. Skeptoid was one. Yeah. Freeman was one. I no, mean, it was a success. That's why we need to have it happen again. If you yeah. guys want to have somebody on... Shoot us an email. Yeah. Shoot us a tweet at Smart People Pod. Smart People Pod. Yep. Okay, so let's get into our guest this week. It is Brian Orend, and Brian is the director of international studies and a professor of philosophy at the University of Waterloo in Canada. His PhD is from Columbia University, and he's also taught there. He taught at the University of London, Sweden. He, he's delivered, you know, lectures all around the world. He spoke at the Naval Academy, you were saying. As John mentioned, two of his books are used as textbooks in college. And he writes for the New York Newsday, Los Angeles Times. The thing is, despite all of his accomplishments, you will just be able to tell and you will agree he is just a really smart, well-spoken, and kind dude. Very passionate about... Oh, I love what yeah, he said about passion passionate. right off the bat. You guys got to listen to first couple minutes. He was a history major, and it's taken in places. So, you know, not all is lost if you feel like you had one of those... Uh, unemployment majors if as he as he put it yeah double major history and philosophy yeah it's like his parents were probably pissed his parents were probably like great double unemployed but the guy but knows now look. His stuff we center most of the conversation around his most recent book the morality of war and uh keep an eye out soon the updated version will be coming where he talks about drones and, you know, the current crisis that, that are going on. It's, Libya. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But we're going to let you hear the interview. It was fantastic. We'll catch up with you in 25, 30 minutes. Brian, the first thing I did want to ask you is the subject of our conversation today is going to be war and the things that surround it. And where we like to start off a lot of times is how did you become, you know, would you say fascinated with this topic or how did you begin to focus in on war and its repercussions and things like that? Well, 
I've always been interested in war. I think lots of people, especially men, uh, tend to be interested in war. Back in my bachelor degree days, I actually have um, uh, a double major in history and philosophy. So I always had this kind of blended interest in philosophical concerns about morality and justice on the one hand, but then a real kind of empirical, factual uh, interest in human history and how have things come to be this way. And when we think about war, you know, whether we've been involved in battle or not, and I never have, and I hope never to be in a battle, but if you think about it historically, all of our lives have been deeply shaped by war. You just put all those interests together and uh, you realize that there's a million fascinating questions to ask about warfare, how it gets started, how it gets fought, how it gets terminated. And so I just, as a philosopher, I just love the challenge of all those interesting questions. You know, and I do want to dive into war and, and the things that surround it, but it strikes me, I was actually reading something today talking about college majors and where they where they take you. And you said you were a philosophy and history major, right? That's right. Yeah. Now, when you went into that, and you're a smart dude, I mean, we'll talk about it in our intro and everything, but you have your PhD from Columbia and you've taught at Columbia and other universities and written a lot of books. Was that on your mind? Like, what am I going to do with a history and a philosophy major? Or were you just like, this is what I enjoy. I'm going to learn about it and something will come of it. Yeah, it was much more the uh, the second, right? That, um, But also, you know, I think that there is some practicality in focusing on what you're really good at, right? Because now that I'm on the other side of it, of the equation as a professor, I teach a lot of people, for example, in accounting program, right? And that's very, you know, useful, et cetera. But I meet a lot of them and they're just miserable in their programs. And I actually wonder, well, where are they going to be in 12 or 15 years, right? Whereas I know that when I meet like the passionate people who are in philosophy, you know, the stereotype, you know, stamp of unemployment or something, right? I just know <laughs> because they're passionate. Um, and they're mentally curious and things like that. Uh, I'm not as worried about where they're going to be in 12 to 15 years. You know, they'll, there's a million things to do in the new economy, right? And people, people just find ways to work it out. I love that response. I really do, especially what right, you said about right. the curiosity, because that's one of the things we talk about a lot is just being curious about different things. And I think yeah. if you yeah. try to follow someone else's dream or goal or path, that curiosity kind of gets stripped away from you. And that's what you're saying you see in these in these students. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Okay. Well, and then now moving on to the interesting subject, like like we were talking about war. I wanted to first talk to you about just war theory. I'm not very familiar with it. I know that your book, The Morality of War, it has been said to be the almost textbook on it. So I was hoping you could explain to me and people that aren't as versed in it what that means. Yeah. Well, we've all heard of uh, various laws of armed conflict, like the Geneva Conventions, right? These are uh, you know, referred to in lots of Hollywood films and stuff like that. And these international laws um, uh, were the product of centuries and centuries worth of thinking. And that, that prior background tradition of thought uh, is just war theory, right? So essentially all, you know, the Hague Conventions, the Geneva Conventions, uh, all the contemporary laws of armed conflict, they grow out of this kind of deeper, older tradition of thought known as just war theory. Now, it goes... It goes all the way back to the Greco-Romans, and it draws on a variety of sources. You know, there's some Christian sources, and then later on there's some uh, secular sources as we uh, move into the modern age. But at its core, um, there's, there's a conviction that it can sometimes be morally justified for a country to go to war. Um, and this kind of distinguishes just war theory from, from two other kind of big rival theories about the ethics of war and peace. So uh, there's realism, pacifism, and just war theory, right? So pacifism, of course, is that, well, war is never morally justified. It's always wrong for a variety of reasons, right? It leads to bad consequences. It violates important duties that we have. It's not a virtuous activity. So war is always wrong. So that's one extreme. Then the other extreme is realism, 
which says that war and morality have nothing to do with each other. You can't link justice and war, right? War is just a bare-knuckled struggle for survival. Um, and if we find ourselves in war, the goal is to win. It is to win by any means necessary. So it's all about uh, kind of power and victory. So I view those kind of two views as being the extremes. And then the middle ground is this just war attitude, which is sometimes war is right and sometimes war is wrong. Uh, and then we need to think through circumstances in which uh, war can be right and war can be wrong. And over the centuries, this has led just war theorists to devise a set of rules uh, uh, to help guide decision makers uh, about when to go to war and how to conduct themselves during war and then how to wrap up war. And that kind of makes me think about John and I were talking today about drone strikes. And I guess what I was thinking of when you said there's a there's a conduct of war almost. And now, and I, you know, if you think about the old days or you watch the movie The Patriot when they march right at each other and yeah. shoot them and it's very, you know, it's just structured. And when we move to this thing with drone strikes where in America we look at it as we're saving lives in terms of American lives and all that. But would that violate a just war theory in your opinion? I mean, we're just dropping bombs out of the sky and, and uh, you know, I'm wondering where that kind of stands in, in the scheme of things. Yeah, great. Um, I think I can uh, confidently say that um, the just war tradition is very unsettled right now about drones. Mm -hmm. And there's a real debate amongst just war theorists right now about what to think of drones. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there are people who say, look, um, the drone technology can be uh, quite discriminating, right, between combatants and non-combatants. Um, it can minimize certainly casualties to our side, right, because they're mm -hmm. unmanned, right? They're an unmanned system. Um, they can be very cost effective, uh, even though, you know, they seem very expensive per unit. But if a military campaign is carried out mainly through drones, right? This is actually going to save a lot of money uh, than compared to putting a ton of soldiers on the ground over there. On the other hand, though, there's people who I like the fact that you referred to the Patriot and some older older traditions of, of thinking who say that there's something disturbing about uh, the violence uh, being so far removed from mm -hmm. the actual battlefield, right? That, right. you know, the decision, you know, people in battle, warriors should look each other in the eye, right? And that this this puts another threshold against the use of violence, right? Whereas if you just essentially have a bunch of video gamers in some compound, in some uh, underground in Las Vegas, controlling drones that are operating on the other side of the world, right? Um, the notion is there's being a, a disconnection introduced there in a mode of fighting that is historically unprecedented and probably dangerous because uh, the fear is that it makes the killing a lot easier, right? You know, if you have to kill someone and look them in the eye, this is a very intense, dramatic human situation, right? And it, it calls forth for all kinds of restraint and things like this, right? Whereas if you're just pressing a button and playing with a joystick, much easier to uh, to order those kinds of deaths, right? So there, on the one hand, there's a fear that technology uh, can spare us casualties. It might be more discriminating as we get to use it better on the one hand, but then on the other, there's a concern that we kill too much as it is, and if we make killing easier, this is only going to end badly. Has this debate been going on for years because you know, I, I think of ways that we've moved to kill people with, you know, dropping atomic bombs, yeah. using landmines, all these things that are ways to kind of disconnect yourself from from the actual killing. So, I mean, has this been a struggle through, you know, these just war theorists for, for a while now? Ab absolutely, right? And um, in, in many ways, it's almost like the same issues come up each time an important new technological development comes up with weapons, right? So right. as you pointed out, well, the atomic weapons get invented. Well, uh, are they humane? Uh, do they violate the rules, right? So right now, um, you know, some of the new technologies include drones, include cyber warfare, uh, things of this nature. 
Uh, and so we get the same kinds of questions, right? Well, here's a new thing. Here's a new instrument of uh, mayhem and death. Um, can it be used humanely? Can it be used in a way that discriminates between civilians and soldiers? Um, uh, it, can it uh, be restrained to be a, a proportionate amount of killing? Um, or does it make things too easy? Is it too indiscriminate? Uh, and is it likely to kind of escalate the violence? Have you looked at all about the the differences between the way Western civilization and Eastern civilization view war? Yeah, I have. I have. And um, it's interesting. It's a lot more similar than what you might expect, right? Okay. Um, And I think that, in a way, it reminds me of the differences, let's say, between Eastern religions and, and Western religions, right? Um, you know, at first, these things seem very different. Uh, you know, there's different symbols, there's different conception of the universe. But when it comes down to, like, you know, basic ethical precepts of how to treat each other, right, um, then it's very similar, right? Uh, you know, let's say how, how Buddhism recommends we treat each other versus how Christianity recommends how we treat each other. You know, love, compassion, forgiveness, empathy, understanding, alleviation of suffering, So when you first look at, uh, let's say, uh, from the Oriental tradition, something like Sun Tzu's Art of War, right? At first, he he goes out of his way to say he's not moralizing about this, and he's just giving a recipe for how soldiers and generals should conduct themselves. But it's clear as you read on, right, that he's he's recommending that, um, uh, you know, uh, officers behave in a restrained way, in a in a wise way, they make effective use of their forces. They shouldn't allow their soldiers to indulge in bloodlust or anything like this. And so it turns out, I think the the deeper you look at it, that uh, there's robust similarities between East and West when it comes when it comes to war. Coming from that line of thinking, do you see the thought of human rights being similar? You know, East versus West or all over the world? I think that as in the, you know the United States and on the West we view human rights differently as other parts in the world. I mean how are we going about deciding what these global human rights actually should be? Well, I think this is a terrific question. Um myself I do believe that human rights are are universal values. I mean these are entitlements that uh kind of benefit everyone, right? I mean who doesn't want their lives, right? Who doesn't want basic freedoms uh, to do things, uh, to do important things that they desire in their life, right? Who doesn't want not to be discriminated against, right? Or not to be tortured, right? Or to be entitled to certain protections uh, under the law if you're charged with a crime. Now, it is this very interesting debate, right? Uh, So so the, the way I like to see it is that I think when we talk about human rights, that there's there's a core to the concept that is universally shared, and that if we ask the man or the woman on the street in China, you know, wouldn't you prefer to vote for your government? <laughs> uh, don't you want physical security in your life? Uh, don't you want material subsistence? I'm pretty sure we ask that question anywhere in the world to the ordinary person. Uh, they say yes, I want these things. Of course, yeah. Now we might differ on the on uh, between civilizations about the full list of the things that we want to claim as human rights, right? So you know, I think uh, there is there is some difference there, but I think the real difference actually comes from uh, leaders in non-Western societies who pretend that they speak for their people. Um, when they say that, well, human rights are, are Western values, and uh, and these values don't apply to us here, and we should always just keep in mind that the leaders who make those arguments have a huge vested interest in human rights not being respected in their society, right? Because they would lose power, right? They would be the fr- they would be the big losers if their societies uh, decided to respect human rights. You know, they would have a lot to lose, right? So, you know, I don't mean to be flippant about it. I think there are, uh, you know, meaningful, permissible cultural differences uh, when it comes to human rights, but not when it comes to that kind of really basic uh, core set of entitlements that are just uh, meant to benefit every single person. And that if we ask the ordinary man on the street, woman on the street, do you want these things? 
everyone is going to say yes. Having not been familiar with just war theory and then talking about human rights and kind of um, how most people have the same beliefs when it comes to that, and then realizing that what war does in terms of destroy civilizations, ruin lives, and, and things like that, it just seems like there's such a harsh difference between war and human rights. I'm interested to hear what does just war theory say about when it's okay to go to war? It's a terrific way to put it, right? It's a nice juxtaposition to say, well, how can you talk of human rights and then but talk permissively about uh, the use of violence, right? Um, right. So why should, why don't I be a pacifist, right? It doesn't, wouldn't that uh, be mandated by respect for human rights? And I think under ordinary circumstances, it would be, right? Who, who wouldn't prefer kind of the peaceful respect for, for everybody's rights? But the rub is that uh, the world is not filled with wonderful people and wonderful regimes. And there are, you know, not just bad apples, but really ferocious, nasty aggressors out there. And they behave in violent ways and they attack people, uh, people who can't uh, defend themselves. And so that's really the opening for, for just war thinking, right? That uh, it's to deal with these exceptional uh, aggressive threats, right? These people who use uh, mass violence to violate the rights of defenseless people. It's only under those circumstances that we can think about the justified use of force, right? So defending your own people from such aggressors, uh, defending uh, other people in other countries, especially your allies uh, from such aggressive attackers, right? These are kind of commonly considered to be just causes for going to war. Uh, perhaps engaging in an armed humanitarian intervention, right? Like when, when a foreign country has a regime and it turns violently, brutally on its own people, and those people are defenseless, um, that, you know, they need our help uh, uh, to save them if we can, right? Um, so classic modern examples would be, well, you know, the people of Rwanda in the summer of 94 you know, they really needed someone to come and help rescue them from the brutality that was going on with the attempted genocide. Sadly, it didn't happen, uh, but it's often thought of as, you know, that would have been a justified use of force, right? Uh, other examples, you know, perhaps the biggest uh, consensus would be something like the Second World War on the part of the Allies, a classic just war, right? They, here you had an absolute definition of a rights-violating aggressor with the Nazis. Uh, and even Imperial Japan. And uh, they were the ones who chose to start to behave in that way. Uh, we tried other measures short of war to deal with these threats. In the end, those measures didn't work. Uh, and so we had to resort to force, and we were justified in doing so uh, because of the threat uh, that those regimes posed. And we tried alternatives. The alternatives didn't work. Uh, and so really there's no uh, other moral choice but to defend our lives and defend uh, uh, the lives of people who can't defend themselves, provided we do so in an appropriate and measured kind of way. In your opinion, in the past, have we done enough post-war and then present day, are we doing enough in our current conflicts in that justice after war period where we should be helping to rebuild these countries that we've either you know, freed from some type of evil regime, or if, you know, their human rights are being violated, whatever it may be, are we doing enough? Well, I think this is, uh, I appreciate the question. It is just a subject that's, uh, that's close to my heart. Um, it's only really recently that uh, uh, thinkers have kind of really wrestled with the issue of, of post-war justice, right? Historically, it was always just assumed that, you know, to the, to the winner go the spoils of war, uh, but but we saw where that attitude uh, got us. Uh, <laughs> quite often, it would just uh, keep up a cycle of violence um, through, across generations uh, that wasn't very helpful to anybody. Uh, so certainly post-World War II, right, especially with the reconstruction of West Germany and Japan uh, by the United States, um, this seemed to work so well uh, in preventing a further war, in rebuilding societies that were now peaceful, that were now productive, good, uh, legitimate regimes, right, that their own people endorsed, um, that this 
you know, investing in them through the Marshall Plan, uh, regrowing their economies. Um, this seemed to work so well that it provided this great kind of blueprint for uh, how kind of post-war reconstruction or even rehabilitation of broken societies might, might happen. Now, of course, we've tried to do this uh, post-war in Afghanistan and post-war in Iraq uh, for the past 10, 12 years. And I think it's fair to say that it hasn't gone nearly as well um, as did Germany and Japan. But we just have to keep in mind that those were the absolute best cases, right? And not every case of post-war reconstruction is going to turn out um, perfectly or is going to mimic the very best case. So I think with Iraq and Afghanistan, um, I think mistakes have been made. Um, I think more could have been done to secure those societies from violence uh, in the immediate post-war atmosphere. I think more could have been done to invest in the economic development of those societies. Um, but, you know, for those kind of challenges and kind of difficulties, there have been successes, right? They've reconstructed the political regimes. Uh, there's right, so the Taliban are gone. That's good. Saddam Hussein is gone. That's good. There's new democratically elected regimes. Um, there's new you know, systems of the rule of law. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan, there's a whole slew of new rights for for girls and women. So I think with the current cases, it's it's a mixed bag of kind of success and failure. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, whether we can do more right now. I think, as I was saying, I think we could have done more in that kind of initial part where the regimes were falling uh, to move in to secure things better and to, to jumpstart their economies more. You know, a kind of war fatigue or post-war reconstruction fatigue sets in after a while. And I think that countries essentially have about 10 years or so to really try to do post-war reconstruction as, as best they can, um, and then for societies to, to move on from there. Something just came to me regarding education. I mean, do we actually go over there and try to educate their youth so that they're not being taught the same thing that, you know, maybe their older siblings or their parents or whoever was taught by that country, you know, because basically they teach hatred towards certain areas, do we go over there and try to influence their education system or, you know, help them out with curriculum saying, hey, we're not really as terrible as you think we are? Yes, we do. Right. Um, and this is certainly this is certainly done with Germany and Japan. Right. In right. A very right. direct, clear way. Um, but uh, and certainly it is being done in Afghanistan and um, much less to a less degree in, in Iraq. Right. And but the focus, the focus of the uh, attempts at educational reform in Afghanistan, it's not as heavy-handed as what it might sound like, right? Uh, mm. The focus is much more on things like basic literacy, basic numeracy, right? Wow. Um, th these are things that um, are desperately needed in Afghanistan, right? To to grow a more sophisticated economy. Um, now, now, I guess. The most controversial thing uh, with the education system in Afghanistan is since we've been there, we've insisted on uh, the rights of girls and women uh, to get educated. In fact, my country in Canada, um, we've, uh, as, as part of our war effort over there, right, like, you know, the Americans do the bulk of the war fighting, right, because they have the capability, right? Mm -hmm. But then other international allies kind of come in once peace has been established in a given region, and they focus on different tasks, right? So, for example, Canada has built a bunch of schools for girls and women there, right? Wow. And we sent over teachers. Um, and then it becomes this very interesting blend, right, when we talk about post-war reconstruction of kind of um, soldiers, teachers, civil servants, and there's this blending uh, 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 from conflict into kind of international development assistance, right? Because essentially this is what what is needed after after a war has destroyed a society, right? It needs to be uh, reconstructed. And that's so fascinating because that's an area that I never really thought about. Like the post-war reconstruction didn't really cross my mind. It was like, oh, okay, we might lift sanctions and that kind of stuff to kind of right. let their economy start growing or, or whatever you have. But 
I didn't think about everything that really goes into it. I mean, you're talking about almost the a same type of rebuild. Yeah, the same type yeah. of planning that you would prior to going to war. It's exactly true, right? And uh, and I guess it makes uh, it makes everything a lot more complicated, right? But the, but the hope is when you engage in post-war reconstruction, you do so um, so that there won't be a second war, that you will manage to break the cycle of violence and hatred, um, and that you will you will welcome a new society into the international community, and then down the line maybe even have like a a robust trading partner, right? I mean, which clearly happened with, you know, between America and Germany and America and Japan, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, these uh, these countries uh, get along extremely well now, right? Just, you know, 50, 60 years later after they were absolutely mortal enemies. That's a good point, actually. I guess it's, <laughs> it's tough for us to, you know, uh, comprehend just because that was long before we were born. But yeah. You're right. I mean, it could be, I guess, looking at the bright side, it could be that way maybe with us in the Middle East come, you know, 50, 100 years from now, which would be fantastic. It certainly would be fantastic. Uh, but it takes lots of time, tons of effort, tons of money. Uh, it tests people's will and patience. Um, but as long as there's a real, I think, like uh, commitment, like a goodwill and a real partnership uh, between all the people involved, then then clearly it seems uh, the, the only way to go to at least try to do this kind of thing, right? And one thing that I, I try to do is take the perspective of the other side, and I'm not worldly enough to know it, but perhaps you do. I mean, is it at all kind of egocentric or ethnocentric or whatever the correct centric word is to think, you know, we're going to go in there and solve your problems and rebuild it and you'll be better off. Is there a legitimate concern about them saying we don't want you to and and now you're just basically being a bully? Yeah, well, I I certainly think that it has to be um, a process and it has to be a dialogue and that if after, let's say, you've defeated the regime and the regime was the real problem and the regime, the regime is gone, and then if the people make it clear that that's all that they were looking for, thank you very much, we, we've got it from here. Um, I think if that message is very clearly conveyed, then, then we would have to be very careful about uh, insisting beyond that, right? But quite often what we see, and certainly we saw it in Afghanistan, and we saw it uh, maybe even more clearly in Iraq, is that uh, the people there, after the decrepit regimes were gone, very much wanted the help, right, uh, of the West, right? Uh, you know, they wanted the resources, they wanted the, the physical security that um, uh, Western forces could uh, provide. But then that's just the start of it, right? And then you have to kind of engage in this dialogue of, you know, we have found that this has worked in the past. How might it work here? Here's what we did in Japan, but we're, we realize it's, it's disanalogous in some ways to Afghanistan, but, uh, you know, what kind of amendments uh, uh, to the overall blueprint need to be made here, right? But in the end, um, I think all you can do is make a good argument and base it on historical evidence of what has worked in the past. Uh, And if in the end the people over there uh, are determined to go their own way, uh, so long as they don't present an ongoing threat anymore, then we have to obviously defer to their wishes and go. Just really interesting stuff. I think it's so pertinent, especially at this time and probably throughout history. But I mean, everybody just hears about it constantly. You know, the war we've had going on in the Middle East has been going on forever, um, it seems like. So kind of educating ourselves and hearing people like you and reading your books are really good things. The knowledge is power kind of analogy. So I, I did just want to say, you know, thanks so much for sharing all of this. The morality of war is fantastic. Oh, and and I wanted to see if, you know, there's anywhere that our listeners could go to kind of find out a little bit more about you, if you have a website or some other places you might want to let them know about. Yeah, I do have a website. It's brianaren.com. So uh, my name, uh, .com. I have a variety of uh, other books. Uh, I'm actually right now, right as we speak, I'm doing a, a second, working on a second edition of the Morality of War uh, to update everything, and uh, that should be out uh, uh, in September. 
Oh, fantastic. And will you be kind of including the current state of war and, and things like that? Is that what you're updating? That's right. In fact, today I just wrote a little bit about drones and so <laughs> cyber warfare, drones, the, all the all the latest, uh, you know, the um, uh, the intervention in Libya, uh, the situation in Syria. Uh, you know, there's unfortunately, right? There's uh, there's always something new and uh, important going on with armed conflict and affecting people's lives around the world. So. Uh, got a, I've got a bunch of updating to do, uh, but I'm really uh, enjoying the challenge of doing it. Yeah, it's almost like rewriting a book. I mean, I, yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, know. I don't want to scare you off halfway through. <laughs> it's perfect, though, because this, this interview is, is a teaser for our listeners, and they have you know the, the updated book to look forward to. Right, right. Great, perfect. Great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Brian. Well, again, thank you so much for, for being on the show. We appreciate you know you talking with us. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, and just great to meet you guys, and just wonderful to chat with you tonight. Absolutely. All right, Likewise. thanks so thank much. You. Have a great night. Okay, you too. Take care. All right, Brian. That was Brian Orend in his talk on the morality of war. You can find out more about him www.brianorend.com that's o-r-e-n-d.com hey guys you know again thanks for tuning in uh, it's been a good 2012 we are looking forward to some big stuff in 2013 there's some things on the plate that we've been waiting for for a few months i i don't know if we have said anything but we'll, we'll find out but the podcast is continuing to grow i mean we keep seeing more activity more downloads more people checking out the site John and I want to spin it off into some more podcasts or uh, we mentioned in the newsletter a book or, you know, uh, expand the website. So let us know what you think. I mean, kind of engage with us and let us know what you like about it if you can or what you would change, what you want to hear. We really want to make this thing big next year. So we appreciate you guys being part of it. Yeah, let us know what you want to see more of. Also, it would be a huge help if you head over to iTunes and rate us and leave a comment. Yeah. If we can move up in the iTunes charts, we can do some things that we normally aren't able to do, and that has to coincide with the announcement that we have coming out in 2013 at some point. Yeah. But if you guys can do anything for us, it's rate us and comment on iTunes. We definitely appreciate it. All right. So um, have a happy new year, and we'll catch you in 2013 as long as the Mayan calendar is wrong. Yeah.